I don't have a good explanation for that. Yeah. Great. Okay, and then moving on to gulls, we've heard a lot about gulls today. Uh, we're looking at two species of uh, gull, glaucus gull and Iceland gull. And as others have remar remarked already, they're very easy to, to count using uh, UAV. So we were interested in counting the number of um, nest sites as well as the number of chicks. And this kind of gives you an idea of how they're nesting. So they're nesting on cliff faces here and um, you know, they can be quite difficult to, to count from, from a boat, uh, especially the, uh, the chicks, which blend in quite well with the background. And uh, here's a, a magnification of the same cliff. And just to give you kind of a little summary of some of, the, of what we, we, we found, um, for both species, basically they would fly off calling as soon as the drone came nearby. So they would take off um, and uh, all adults in the colony would, would uh, take off and fly off. Um, but they wouldn't attack, uh, unlike the herring gulls, they wouldn't actually attack the UAV, they just kind of fly off and scold. Uh, they returned within five minutes, so the, the longest any bird um, took to return was five minutes. Most of them were back within two and three minutes. Uh, so apparently habituating to the, to the presence of the UAV. The counts were very similar to the uh, ground count, so they seemed to give a very accurate uh, number. However, the UAV found more chicks than the, the ground count. So I think that was uh, kind of interesting. We really thought that we counted every single chick and then we went and did it via UAV. We'd find a few chicks that, um, you know, and, and just a small number, but, uh, you know, 5% more chicks than we actually thought were there. Um, just recently, we've been trying out a fixed wing drone, which has the advantage of being able to fly in uh, higher winds. Um, it also can go up for much longer. So instead of going up for just a, a, a few minutes or you know, 20 minutes or so, this can go up for a couple hours. And uh, this can allow us to survey a much larger area of the colony with, uh, with a, kind of a single pass. And it can also carry a somewhat larger load. Um, but uh, it's more difficult to, to get it to take off. You have to launch it. And then having it land is more difficult as well. Oh, and we, we made it look like a gannet. So we thought that maybe it would be, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it would camouflage it a little bit. And so um, here's an example of some of the, uh, the footage from a, um, well, this is, this is actually from a manned aircraft, but we're, I'm gonna, we're using them to try and sense this um, gannets. And this should be a relatively simple pro um, problem because uh, the gannets really stand out. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything yet from the fixed wing, but we're gonna, um, we've collected some data and hopefully we'll uh, uh, be able to get some of that analyzed before too long. And so I just wanna finish up with kind of uh, conclusions uh, in terms of what we've found so far in terms of cliff nesting birds, um, that the takeoff distance should be at least 30 meters away, that the birds react mostly to the, um, to the takeoff noise. So taking off 30 meters away reduced seabird flushing by about um, 20%, so it's useful to take off further away. It actually didn't seem to matter too much how close we, um, we, uh, you know, we, um, we could come fairly close. Uh, I mean, trying to still maintain the 30 meter distance, but we could come fairly close, but it was really that takeoff, which would cause a lot of flushing. The seabirds seem to react to drones in areas with aerial predators. So again, kind of context specific. So they reacted much more in Newfoundland than they did in um, the Arctic. And one possible explanation is that we do have eagles there in Newfoundland, which are um, flying down and uh, uh, catching adult murs. So in in-flight distance, we uh, found that 15 meters was uh, you know, a little bit too close and that 30 meters uh, caused fewer birds to flush. And that you know, there's a strong effect of non-breeders. So non-breeding birds would flush more easily at the approach of the drone, creating kind of a chain reaction. So once a few flush, then a whole bunch more non-breeders would, uh, would flush. So trying to focus on the, uh, the breeding birds uh, helped. Okay. So I want to thank the main people that helped me along the way. And hopefully I finished in time and we can have a little bit of coffee.
very much, Carl. Yeah. Um, how's the jet like? Yeah, <laughs> a little woozy. <laughs> <laughs> a little woozy, yeah. good. Well, we'll be coming soon. Does anybody have any oh. quick questions for Carl before we head off? Yeah? Can you just, you just said that they were habituating after five minutes. Were they habituating or were they just getting desperate to get back to the ranks? Um, I think that they were habituating both in that um, with repeated flights, so with, with the MERS, when we did repeated flights, you'd get the same reaction every time. There was no evidence of habituation with the gulls. When we did repeated flights, they'd stop reacting after a few flights. So I think there was clear habituation, even within that um, uh, uh, you know, first flight. Uh, sure, there might have been some birds which just wanted to get back to the chick, but there are other ones which didn't have any chick and would still just go back to the cliff after a little while. So probably a bit of both. Uh, so in Newfoundland, they were all common, and in or mostly common, and in the Arctic, they were all uh, Yeah. Did you notice any image flaring on the fixed wing compared to the helicopter? Uh, well, so we had a, a much better camera on the fixed wing. Um, if we tried to do this with the GoPro, we wouldn't have um, been able to pick up too much because of uh, that issue with the blurring. And we were, so with the fixed wing, we were able to go further away, have a better quality uh, camera. Okay, uh, there should be some coffee somewhere. The question you're asking yourself is, when's the plenary? The plenary's at six o'clock. I think food, uh, there's, there's food after that, isn't there after the plenary? Um, for those of you who uh, be interested in coming back for us to discuss how we collate all the things that you've heard about today, by no means full three, it's very much optional, but it'd be really handy uh, people like Matty and Alec and I are gonna uh, get our heads together. Um, more than welcome to contribute to that. Um, I guess we'll uh, aim to come back and meet about 25 past four. That will give time, people time to get a cup of coffee and uh, find their way back and take a couple of breaks. So it just remains uh, to thank all our speakers today that we've heard from. So thank you very much to them. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. This, the video of these sessions will be available online sometime, somehow, no, and as will Norms. Um, and uh, may see you back after the break. Thank you very much.